Hello friends, welcome to another theoretical lecture on non-ferrous metallography and characterization techniques. So in this lecture, the theoretical one, we will be focusing on titanium and its alloys. Now titanium and its alloys, they bear uh, much similarity to magnesium and aluminium, particularly when you talk about uh, the era or the period during which they began to be produced in the large scale or the industrial scale and our usage. If you could recollect, we saw that the magnesium and aluminium, their industrial scale production began in the early 1900s and correspondingly uh, because of our usage, the industrial scale production, they all relate to one another and it began in the early 1900s for magnesium and aluminium. Titanium is even later than that, the industrial scale production began only in the mid 1900s, so right around 1940s. And based on that, and uh, we were uh, be we began using titanium from that period onwards. So when you compare it to say copper, these are uh, still in their uh, infant stages. And uh, if some of you would want to work on a material that's been around very recently, titanium is one of the candidate that you can look into. So the discovery of uh, titanium is also something interesting because this was discovered by not a chemist or a metallurgist or any other scientist. This was first discovered by a clergyman or you could say some sort of a preacher. His uh, name was William Gregor. He discovered it in the year 1791. So he was uh, taking a stroll along the beaches of Cornwall, his place in Great Britain. And he found that there were a few characteristic stands, sands rather, they were uh, getting attracted to magnets. So in addition to being a clergyman, he was an amateur uh, geologist. So he was interested in these sands and he found that these sands were, uh, as opposed to other sands, these sands were getting attracted to magnet and they had some magnetic properties. And when he collected them and when he studied them, he found these sands comprised of two different oxides. So one of the oxide was iron oxide and uh, this gave the sands a typical color. And the other oxide was rather uh, a colorless one or a light colored one and he didn't know what this particular sand was or this particular oxide was. So he studied them a bit deeply, he examined them and also he investigated on them and given their uniqueness he reported it to the, uh, he reported his results to the local Royal Geological Society of Cornwall and to honor him they named this particular uh, oxide as Gregorite. Now, just few years, or exactly four years later, a chemist named uh, Martin Heinrich Kalproth in Germany, he was working on a different set of oxides and he also accidentally discovered that uh, there, is exist, there exists a new form of oxide that was uh, relatively, or when you compare it to the other oxide, the strength was uh, uncharacteristically huge. The strength of this particular oxide was uh, uncharacteristically or uh, noticeably greater than other oxides and since this oxide was not uh, or the uh, the characteristics of this ox oxide was not reported so far he thought this would be something new and he named that as titanium given that or uh, the the name stems from the greek mythology titans and this name he chose because of the exceedingly high strength of these oxides and uh, Martin, he began to work on this oxide and later he realized that in the year 1797, he realized that the Gregorite, which was already reported in the Royal uh, Geological Society of Cornwall, is nothing but the titanium that he has discovered a couple of years before. So unlike uh, William Gregor, who was an amateur uh, researcher or an amateur scientist who gave up on his work, Karl Proth, he did not give up on his work, he continued his research and uh, on titanium or titanium oxide specifically and he revis revisited his original uh, discovery and he said that it's not me there was some person who has already reported it earlier and uh, that Gregorite and whatever I proposed or whatever I discovered is the same so this is something that uh, we need to understand between someone who is uh, doing science for uh, fun and who does it for uh, a living so it is our ethical duty to report uh, like what here Mr. or Dr. Karl Proth did, the chemist, that uh, whenever you find there is an overlap in our uh, research or whenever you find that your results might something be new but it has already been uh, 
reported it is our duty ethically in order uh, that we should report it and we have to cite it so this is something that makes uh, when you compare someone with uh, who do just do research uh, for its own sake and who do research for a living who wants to be ethically responsible in what they report uh, this is how they do it you go back to your uh, discovery and then you explain or if you find something that uh, has a, a certain degree of overlap you let the community know that there has been this degree of overlap even before i started working on it so this is something that we could learn so even though the discovery was made uh, around or uh, in the end of uh, the 18th century the industrial scale production or the method for it began in the year 1910 so the first isolation of titanium frem its oxide form was made in the year 1910 and this was made by none other than uh, professor matthew hay hunter from where we get our process called hunter's process for extracting titanium so if you could see here the uh, initial discovery began in the year 1791 and the first separation of uh, the titanium from its oxide it took close to another 100 years to achieve that so the reason for uh, such um, delay in extracting titanium from its uh, ore will be evident when you consider the properties of titanium so given this historical backup let us get into the titanium and its alloys so what uh, what are the ways we can categorize the titanium and its alloy so of course we can begin uh, as in all cases like for instance other non-ferrous metals that we have uh, looked into the first alloy is always the pure one so similarly titanium also has its commercially pure titanium alloy so it has few traces of nitrogen hi hydrogen oxygen and iron these are just impurities and particularly in some cases uh, the traces of oxygen is uh, is volitionally increased so that uh, it can improve the mechanical properties so titanium is uh, allotropic non-ferrous metal meaning it exhibits two different crystal structure at the different temperatures so you have a crystal uh, you have a definite temperature above which the crystal structure of the commercially pure titanium varies so alpha is uh, the stable form of titanium at room temperature so the crystal structure of alpha titanium is bcc and above a certain degree or a certain temperature it transforms into beta and the crystal structure of beta is rather uh, its hexagonal coarse pack structure or it is hcp now this behavior if you could recollect it is referred to as the allo uh, allotropic behavior now the first category of alloys that pertain to titanium is referred to as the alpha alloys now alpha alloys are uh, made or the the stability of the alpha alloys at room temperature is increased by adding alpha stabilizers like aluminium and oxygen so these two elements are alpha stabilizers and if you could look into their phase diagram what they do is they increase the transverse temperature so this is referred to as the transverse temperature and the inclusion of uh, alpha alloys or alpha stabilizers they increase this transverse temperature so alpha alloys they characteristically comprise of certain alloying elements and these alloying elements are the alpha stabilizers and what they do is they increase the transverse temperature the other alloy the other category of titanium alloy is referred to as the near alpha alloys in addition to the alpha stabilizers one to two percent of beta stabilizers uh, that are, uh, is added as the alloying elements and these beta stabilizers are largely molybdenum and vanadium so the inclusion of these beta stabilizers facilitates certain amount of beta phase at the room temperature so this certain amount of beta phase the maximum that is achieved by this inclusion of the beta stabilizers as alloying elements is 10 percent so the alpha alloy it largely comprises of alpha phase in near alpha alloy there is a possibility of having maximum of 10 percent of beta phase and this is achieved by inclusion of one to two percent of beta stabilizers and these are largely molybdenum and vanadium now as opposed to all these uh, three phases wherein the alpha phase is uh, dominant we have beta alloys and these beta alloys are made stable at room temperature by the corresponding beta, beta stabilizer alloying elements and these alloying elements like, like we have seen for near alpha alloys they are molybdenum and vanadium 
So as you can see here in this, uh, so on this phase diagram that the beta stabilizers what they essentially do is they reduce the transverse temperature thereby ensuring that the beta stabilizers or the beta phase of the titanium alloy which is not usually stable at room temperature is now stable. So this is achieved by the inclusion of alloying elements like molybdenum and vanadium which are nothing but the beta stabilizers. Now similar to alpha uh, near alpha alloys we also have near beta alloys. So what near beta alloys what characterizes near beta alloy is that we have dispersed alpha phase in the beta matrix. In the near alpha alloy we saw that there can be maximum 10 percent of beta phase in the alpha matrix. In the near beta alloy we have some percentage of alpha phase in the beta matrix and this is uh, in this set of alloys we have a maximum of 10 to 15 percentage or the range of 10 to 15 percentage alloying elements that are that correspond to beta stabilizers. Now finally we have a definite combination of alpha and beta phase they do not correspond to near alpha and near beta but they are definitively a combination of alpha and beta phase and uh, this particular alloy is achieved by this range of beta stabilizer that is 4 to 16 percent of the beta stabilizers. Generally this alpha beta phase or this alpha beta alloy of titanium it comprises of 10 to 15 percent of beta phase. So for this amount of or this 4 to 16 percent inclusion of the beta stabilizer you would end up with the 10 to percent uh, beta phase in the alpha beta alloy at the room temperature. So rather than having a, desi uh, uh, a designated nomenclature for the different titanium alloys these are largely how we can categorize the titanium alloys and if you could notice all these classifications are based on alpha and beta which is nothing but the different allotrophic forms of the titanium. So depending on uh, the dominant phases the crystal structure varies and depending on the phases that are present at the room temperature you can one can identify which alloying element is present in that alloy. Supposing you have a beta phase at the room temperature or dominant beta phase at, at the room temperature which is, which is not to be the case or which is should not be in the usual case or in case of ideal uh, or pure titanium the reason is because the alloying element comprises of beta stabilizer mainly molybdenum and vanadium. So let us now look into the properties application and how one can etch it in order to view its characteristic microstructure. So let us begin by considering the pure titanium alloy. The reason uh, one would want to manufacture commercially pure titanium alloy is because of its corrosion resistant and also its workability. So given these set of properties pure titanium alloy is uh, used in the tanks and heat exchanges particularly in the chemical processing units. So in case of chemical processing units the environment to which the metal is exposed to or the material is exposed to is highly corrosive and given that the commercially pure titanium is of very good corrosion resistance and for manufacturing certain components you need a good degree of workability given these set of properties the commercially pure titanium uh, alloys are used in the manufacturers of manufacturing of these components like tanks and heat exchangers that are largely used in the chemical processing units. Now in order to view the phases in order to achieve a certain degree of contrast between the grains and, order to, and also to ensure that there is certain degree or there is a controlled form of corrosion in this corrosion resistant material there is one reagent that is often used for uh, type metallography of titanium. So this reagent is referred to as the Nolts reagent and uh, this reagent it comprises of the combination of hydrofluoric acid, nitric acid and water as the solvent. So this reagent is widely used for titanium alloys and it particularly can be used for commercially pure titanium alloys and they uh, allow or they facilitate the controlled corrosion of titanium that enables us to see the different contrast in the grains. So here is one of the examples of the pure titanium um, alloys which has been etched by the Nolts reagent. Now the alpha alloys of titanium if you could recollect they have a certain alloying elements that we can categorize as uh, the alpha stabilizers. They are known for its mechanical properties and also the retention of this mechanical properties at high temperature. 
So given these set of properties, they are used in the corresponding applications wherein these mechanical properties on high temperature properties are demanding, for instance, turbine parts and high temperature structural application. So these alpha alloys, which comprises of the alpha stabilizers are used in the turbine make manufacturing of the turbine parts and the correspond and uh, the other high temperature applications because of the corresponding properties. Now, since alpha alloys, they comprise largely of alpha grains similar to that of the commercially pure titanium alloy. The etching that can be used to visualize all for the metallographic purposes of the alpha alloys is similar to that of the commercially pure titanium alloys. Again, this is because they largely comprises or comprise of the alpha phase of the titanium. And so we can use uh, continue using the non reagent, which is nothing but again the combination of hydrofluoric acid, nitric acid and a large part of water. So here is an example or uh, the characteristic microstructure of the alpha alloy. So you cannot see a definite precipitates here. It's because it is uh, it is generally it offers um, polycrystallinic structure of a single phase. So both commercially pure titanium alloys and also alpha alloy they often render a microstructure that they, that uh, comprises of only one phase in a polycrystalline nature. So let us move on to the near alpha alloys. The characteristic properties that make this particular alloy more applicable is that it's creep resistance, strength and workability. So we have these combinations of properties that is the high temperature uh, retention of the strength and also the actual inherent strength of the material and also the workability of the alpha alloy. So given these set of properties, this particular alloy of uh, titanium is used in aerospace application, particularly in the manufacturing of compressor disc and blades. So the compressor disc, will, uh, they are supposed to be a part of uh, the turbines as well. So in manufacturing of these uh, components in the aerospace application, near alpha alloys of titanium is used. And the reason is because of its characteristic properties, which encompasses the creep resistance, the mechanical strength, and also its workability. Now, similar to all the other alloys that we have considered so far, that is pure titanium or commercially pure titanium alloy and alpha alloy. Since in alpha alloy or the near alpha alloy, the dominant phase is alpha, the reagent or the agent that we use also falls, also is the NOS reagent. And again, it's the combination of a large percent of water within it, you would have your hydrofluoric acid and the nitric acid. Again, this is this we use because the dominant phase that is present in the near alpha alloys is, is alpha, which is also present in the alpha alloys and the commercially pure titanium alloys. Therefore, given the uh, given that the phase fraction of these microstructures are similar, we can we can use non reagent for the metallographic purpose in order to bring about the contrast in the near alpha alloys as well. So as you can see here, there are precipitates of beta that are dispersed in the alpha matrix, thereby characterizing the microstructure of the near alpha alloys. Now, away from these alpha alloys or the near alpha alloys, we have our beta alloys. The beta alloys offer a very good uh, or excellent strength to weight ratio and also is corrosion resistance. Now, as if you could recollect the beta, beta phase of the pure titanium, it is of the hexagonal close pack structure or HTP structure. Now, these alloys are given its crystal uh, crystallographic structure. They render these properties that is high strength to weight ratio and corrosion resistance. Of course, it is the high strength to weight ratio that relate to the uh, crystal structure, not uh, corrosion resistance per se. Now, given these uh, characteristic properties of beta alloys of titanium. It is used in aerospace applications, particularly the wings and the body skins and frame. Supposing uh, you get a chance or if you fly to some place and you, if you look through the window, window and you find the metal, uh, metal skin that covers the wings of your flight, then you would know that it is made of titanium and uh, specifically which alloy it is made of. So this is largely it is made of uh, beta titanium alloys. Now, this beta titanium alloy or the dominant component of this or phase of this beta titanium alloy in its microstructural form is beta phase and therefore a small slight deviation is uh, can be noticed in the etchings that we use in order to 
uh, bring about the contrast in the microstructures of the beta alloy. So the HL that we use in this case comprises of in addition to the hydrofluoric acid and nitric acid it comprises of ammonium bifluoride. So in, in addition to the uh, acids that largely comprise of the NOLS reagent we have the inclusion of ammonium bifluoride for the beta phase and the only difference here is that in a uh, supposed to having a large amount of or a dominant alpha phase in beta alloys they have dominant beta phase. Now of course we can also one can also use NOLS reagent to bring about the contrast in the grains and this is a typical microstructure of the beta alloys and since in the beta alloys similar to the alpha alloys the, the microstructure that we see is polycrystalline in nature and comprises of the only one phase and this one phase in alpha alloy will be alpha phase in case of similarly in case of beta alloys it will be beta phase so all that the contrast would come from the grain boundaries alone and uh, this can contrast can be brought about either by NOS reagents which we have been using and uh, if you want to be more exclusive for uh, beta alloys the one inclusion that you can have in addition to that of hydrofluoric acid and nitric acid which already comprise of the uh, NOLS reagent is the ammonium bifluoride. Now the other alloy wherein the beta phase is dominant is the near beta alloys and near, the near beta alloy is the corrosion resistance which is offered by the beta phase and the titanium in, in as a whole is, uh, is observed in the near beta alloys as well. And in addition to the corrosion resistance, we have good strength and workability of uh, that is offered by the near beta alloys. And owing to this set of uh, properties, the near, near beta alloys are used in uh, nuclear power plants and also petrochemical industries. So these industries where the high temperature properties of the material or particularly the structural material is expected, the near beta alloys is employed. Now again, since near beta employs or rather near near beta uh, alloys which are employed in the uh, nuclear and petrochemical industries they dominantly or largely comprises of uh, beta phase the same HN that was used for the beta alloys can be used in the near beta alloys as well therefore in combination with the hydrofluoric and the nitric acid the ammonium bifluoride can be used in order to etch the near beta alloys of course in addition to that one can replace the ammonium bifluoride with water and ultimately have uh, the NOLS reagent and one can also use this reagent for the visualization or the metallography of near beta alloys. So here is an uh, example of the characteristic microstructure of the near beta alloys as you can see in the grain boundaries and also in the intergranular region one can observe the segregation or the formation of uh, precipitation of the alpha phase within the beta matrix. So here uh, this is the typical example of the microstructure of the near beta alloys where in the matrix of the beta phase you have certain amount of alpha precipitates and uh, these alpha precipitates they facilitate or they render a good amount of uh, mechanical properties and uh, one can also refer to when you compare it to the the alloys wherein you just have a single phase say alpha alloy or beta alloy or commercially pure titanium alloys these given that they are of the single phase you cannot have uh, much of uh, a hardening treatment to them however in cases like this say near alpha alloys and near beta alloys wherein one can have the precipitation of certain phases and thereby establishing a microstructure of a matrix and a precipitate one can uh, have device certain form of heat treatments one there uh, through which we can increase or improve the hardness of the material or the strength of the material. So as opposed to the different alloys that is pure alloys like commercially pure titanium alloys, alpha alloys and beta alloys, these near alpha and near beta which are the combinations of alpha and beta phases, they can they are often referred to as uh, the hardenable alloys wherein uh, meaning that you can appropriately devise certain heat treatment techniques by which you allow the precipitation of the different phases as opposed to the matrix phase and these combination of the precipitate and the matrix ultimately have or establish a good amount of uh, strength and hardness to the material. So this is one of the difference between the different titanium alloys.
Now, finally, what we have is the combination of uh, alpha and beta alloys. So in this, uh, that is, we cannot make a distinction between matrix and precipitate because these are fairly present at uh, more or less in the dominant, what we refer to as the dominant level. The combination of these alloys or rather the combinations of these phases in a single alloy framework would offer a good uh, corrosion resistance and uh, mechanical properties and workability. So this alloys, since it combines the best, best of both worlds, it offers all the good, pop, uh, good properties that alpha and beta alloys offer individually. So by combining these two phases at considerable amount, we now have the best of properties that was offered by alpha alloys and the best of properties that is offered by the beta alloys. So that includes, or to put it generally, it has a good, uh, this alpha and beta alloys, alpha plus beta alloys of titanium, it has a good corrosion resistance, mechanical properties and workability. Now, owing to this uh, combination of uh, properties and particularly given that they combine two good phases of titanium at the very uh, at a very desirable proportion more than 50% of all applications of titanium they belong to this particular alloy that is alpha beta alloys of titanium and uh, a specific or a rather the characteristic application of titanium which is bio implants is largely due to this com this alloy that is the that comprises of the combination of alpha and beta phases so this particular alloy is largely used in the application because it brings the best of both alpha and beta phase and whenever you talk, we think about or you hear the term bio implants that is made up of titanium this is the alloy that is being talked about or this is the alloy that we use for the bio implants particularly for its mechanical property workability and corrosion resistance now given that uh, these, uh, this particular alloy comprises of uh, alpha and beta phase, correspondingly we can either use uh, the NOS reagent or also we can use the combination of hydrofluoric acid, nitric acid and ammonium bliforate. So since this option, like all the titanium alloys, we have this option, it is important to note that the NOS reagents can be used in most of the titanium alloys to get a good contrast between the phases and also in a single phase system to, good con uh, to get a good contrast between the grains as well. This we have seen in the pure titanium or commercially pure titanium alloys. So NOS reagents is something that you could blindly choose when you are handling titanium alloys and when you want to uh, visualize the titanium alloy metallographically, the uh, NOS reagents is you can just choose it without giving a second thought. So these are the different forms of titanium alloys and we have seen that depending on the titanium alloy or the uh, nomenclature of it, meaning in case of pure titanium alloy or commercially pure titanium alloy, you have a single phase microstructure and uh, the only distinction is because of the grain boundaries and the different grain orientation. And in alpha uh, titanium alloy or alpha alloys of uh, titanium, the dominant phase is alpha and in the beta alloys of titanium is the dominant phase is beta. So in all these three, we have one single phase that is present in the microstructures. And uh, so only contrast that comes from the grain boundaries and the different grain orientation. So for all these three um, alloys of titanium, we can use NOS reagent in order to bring about the contrast. For beta dominant alloys or beta alloys, the ammonium bifluoride is used along with the hydrofluoric and nitric acid. The other categories of alloys are the combination of alpha and beta phase. In case of alpha alloy, uh, near alpha alloys, we have a dominant alpha matrix with the small amount of or the precipitate of beta phase in it. And in case of uh, near beta alloys, we have uh, a dominant beta matrix with the alpha precipitate in it. So depending on uh, which phase is dominant, we can choose our agents for uh, alpha dominant microstructure the null agents the NOS agents is preferred for the beta dominant uh, microstructure of titanium the ammonium bifluoride along with the hydrofluoric and nitric acid can be used so the alti finally the best of these two worlds is combined in the alpha beta alloys of titanium and this is the this brings about the good properties of all the individual phases and that is the reason why it is highly applicable so with this i would like to wind up this lecture i hope uh, you are able to distinguish the different forms of uh, microstructures based on the understanding of the alloys of titanium. So let's see ourselves in the next lecture. Goodbye.